Well, I'm here with Anna here in the room at the Writer's House. Hi, Al. Hi. And we've got Christy Williamson here. Christy is in his home in Glasgow. He is a Shetland poet and a Mod po friend and a wonderful poet. And hi, Christy. Thank you for doing this. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks yeah. So so the three of us are going to talk about some particular three passages from a book, a, a long poem, I should say, an epic poem, an epic modernist poem by Hugh McDermott. It's called A Drunk Man Looks at the Thistle. We're, we're going to listen to the first section and then talk generally about the poem, what he's trying to do to the poem, what it has to do with modern and contemporary poetry, which is our Ken. You know, what does it possibly have to do with it? Um, how does it help us understand the modernism's relationship to forms of nationalism, national identity? Uh, and what does it have to do with S Scott's poetry, in particular, Scottish poetry in particular, and how it relates to what's going on in modernism in the U.S.? So. These right. are big, big questions. Yeah. All right. So first, here's Hugh McDermott reading the first uh, three stanzas of A Drunk Man Looks at the Thistle. Deed doon. It's gay and hard work, coatin glass for glass, we Kruvi and Gilsanker and the like, and I'm no just as bald as in so is. The Elbuck Fankles in the course of time, the shackles no say supple, and the thrapple grows deaf and dour, Near langer up and doon, glag as a squirrel spills the Adam's apple. For by, the stuff he's no the real Mackay. The sun sail ins, as soon as ye began it, riz in your vera soul. But what keeks in new is in truth the vilest Saxony planet. So the first question I have for the two of you is, why create a modernist epic? And this is, and Christy will tell us, because he lives this scene, the poetry scene, this is a fundamental modern text in, in Scottish poetry. Why? Why write a Scottish modernist epic about a man, a drunk man, looking at the thistle? Why? What's, get us started, Anna. Well, the thistle, and I hope this doesn't like give anything away, but the thistle is kind of a symbol like of Scotland and of Scottish identity. Why? I mean, why not the rose or the lilac? A well, thistle? Seriously? Christy, how could you tolerate a culture that prizes the thistle? That's a leading uh, question. It's, it's, it, the, the, there is actually a very specific uh, lion uh, reference uh, to the thistle, uh, and if in, in the in the poem, not in the sections that we're looking at today, but there is there are excerpts from the Langham uh, Langham Common writing, uh, uh, which is in that uh, part of Scotland then they have these common writings where uh, all the times people go out on horses and, 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 and they go around the borders of the borough and say this is ours and part of the celebrations involve carrying a crown and a, a Saltern and Bannix, yeah, which are uh, one of the other best, and then this massive thistle, which they parade around. Um, so it had a very specific uh, significance to McDermott. Uh, because when he was growing up, mm -hmm. and it was actually on the borderlands, he was, he was, in uh, northern northern England. Am I right? He wasn't in Scotland proper, but. Elbow was in Scotland, yeah, it was in Langham, which is yeah. but it's been about eight miles from Carlisle, it's very, very close. Right. So. And he observed, he he was part of in fact there's even a photo of him as a very young kid, maybe a twelve year old, in one of these ceremonies. So this is important to his identity. Yeah. So yeah. but but yeah. but back to Anna, so you've got a thistle and you've got these great ambitions. And, and why a drunk man? And wh what's the setup? I mean, I, I, this is the, uh, 
Chris can tell us more about this, but the the Eliot's The Wasteland and Joyce's Ulysses mm-hmm. were both really influential on this poem. Yeah. So why dr- a drunk man looking at it? Why would you write a whole poem in which a drunk person is basically be speaking this whole thing? Why would you do it generally? Yeah. Because that sounds like so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> right? That sounds like so much fun. Like what mm-hmm. an amazing, just the sheer joy of like that project. The like, project take is. A, take a drunken person mm-hmm. and give them the most like weighted symbol of your nation. And talk to it. Christy, it gives... I'm all in. It, it, Anna likes it. It gives, <laughs> it gives McDermott the freedom to experiment uh, linguistically, but all, and I want to ask you about that, but also uh, in terms of topic-to-topic transition. This drunk person is free to move all around because he's drunk. Yeah? <laughs> so can you, can you talk about the license, that the freedom it gave McDermott to write this? Well, he 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 uses he, he uses uh, the strong man to explore um, to explore his feelings for uh, about Scotland, uh, which he's not entirely enamoured with, uh, although he he loves it dearly, um, and and man's place in the universe and his relationship to God. And, uh, and 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 uh, and the great wheel of time and things like this, um, which is the kind of conversational material that that, that he he would uh, he he would associate with uh, a good drinking session, I'd imagine. So he he's writing here in Braid Scott's verse, and he wasn't the first to do this, obviously, by no means. But probably the first modernist to embrace this Robert Burns-ish kind of writing. This is a real merge, am I right, of the old Scottish, you know, back to tradition, we are not really English, this is our language pride, combined with modernism, a modernist technique. So can you say something, and Anna, you're, you're, you spent enough time in Scotland to be able to talk about this. What's the radicalism of his choice of using Braid Scots? Well, he had a he he, he had like a, a trilingual vision for uh, for the the modern of Scotland, and then and he he had he he, he felt responsible. Uh, but he was also working when he was writing a young man. He was he was working very much quite closely with Edward Muir, who was responsible for the. And more anglophonic modernism, right. and was Lynn, who uh, was a bit of a Gallic modern. All right. Well, let's get let's look at um let's look at a line of this first section. So, it seems, okay. yes, uh, I can't do the Braid Scots. I can't do any of it. But so for, forgive me, because I'm you know I'm I'm a New Yorker and I can't. <laughs> uh, for by you're from the, New Jersey. All uh, right, whatever. <laughs> for by the stuffies. Know the real Mackay. Um, the st- stuffy is whiskey. Yeah. For by is like for by is a wonderful word here. It's like yeah. anyhow, yeah. anyway, which is sure. a real. Yeah. That's what drunk people do. Anyway, yeah. what I was what was like. Okay, but what it, he's saying there, Christy, that this is not good whiskey. Yeah, no, he is. So why, what's then, the uh, what's the point of that? Well, I don't. I'm just talking about. Um, he's, he's, he's talking about the national culture that, that he, he has to exist in. He's also talking about, to an extent, about, about that, uh, that spotophobic, as he perceives it, modernism, um, which, which he sees as, uh, as not the real Mackay. And the whiskey, of course, is inextricably linked with Burns. Like you were saying, oh. you know, a Burns supper, a Burns night to celebrate in January, right? January, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Is a an opportunity to recite Burns poetry and drink whiskey. Like that's that's what yeah. one does. The 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 footnote that uh, the edition that I've been using, the Kenneth Boothley edition, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. sees that this is sort of about writing under the influence of Burns or in the you know in the shadow of Burns, as it were, uh, mm-hmm. and and. 
there's uh, an idea that the that this is the literary sun, right? And the sun right. the sun rises and sets. And I think I think it's safe to say that McDermott really felt strongly that he he was very sure of himself sometimes that he would represent the the new the new the new rise of Scottish literary culture. So I want to ask each of you about this opening. Uh, what does it augur? What does it bode? What, why do, Why is this such a powerful opening? We're supposed to imagine a drunk person looking at the thistle and getting started on what will be a Scottish modernist epic. Why is this a good way to start? Well, if I can just come back to the footnote you were talking about a, a minute ago, the um, the Boothley edition also quotes Walter Scott in that moment, and another Scott, key figure. Yeah, right? and Scott and Burns, I think, sort of represent opposites in Scott's literature. That Walter Scott is writing work that takes place in Edinburgh and elsewhere, but is in like English English, proper English, whereas Burns is using like vernacular colloquial Scots. Right. So I think maybe in that moment McDermott is is holding up these two very important literary figures in Scottish history and uh, making an argument for continuing in the Burns mode or or reviving maybe the Burns mode. He's taking a position. Yeah. Christy, why why do you think these this is the this is a great opening to a poem that has its ambitions? Well, I love uh, the the fact that, that he calls the whole poem a drunk man with the pistol, and the first the the the, the, the first four, four sub poem is I have no food, I'm not drunk, so so he's a, he's, he's already he's, he's in that that very first part of he's he's licensing him to protect himself, um, and uh, yeah, so so that and and that that. Leads, leads us in and that, that, that gives him the scope to, to do all the things he does uh, later on in the poem. It creates a structure, it creates a setup, a frame, right? I'm, re I'm drunk, so fasten your seatbelts. I'm yeah. going to go anywhere with this poem, which is, you know, what he got from Joyce in particular, a little, maybe even more than Eliot, right? You know? Yeah, I think... And, and, and the, the, the comparison with you is, is, is I mean, it is, it, it's, 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 you know, I think when we met in Glasgow, you said that, that he sort of says Ulysses, he, he might have even seen it as says Eliad, you know, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's a very, it, and, and it is an epic poem, and it's connecting, it's connecting with that longer tradition before modernism. In, yeah. in, in, in a, in a, and and using it to explore the ideas of what, that, that he espouses and that he's uh, championing. And we are going now to talk about two passages uh, in the middle of the poem. And the first one is, uh, I would say, about uh, a little more than a third of the way into it. And the second one would be close to the end. Uh, and so I'm going to play the first one and ask each of you in a series of questions, like we're just going to do this as a close reading. So I'll go to Anna first. You'll say something about a phrase or a word. Then I'll go to Christy. And we'll just accumulate some observations about what's going on in this part of the poem. We're not going to try to do a close reading. Okay. So, All right, here's McDermott uh, reading this, this passage. It, it's on page 63 of the edition. And it starts with line 149, 149. No, wait a minute. It's uh, 129 of the poem. I do damn galleys mixed, like life itself. But I was never in the folk to pit an ocean in a muchkin. As the hails may have the pit, say I then reason yet. I didn't hold the world's end in my head, as most folk think they do nor filter truth in fishy gills through which its tides may pour for any animalculae forsooth. I laugh to see my crazy little brain and other folks talking itself seriously, and in a sudden low of fun my soul blinks dozent as the owl I can't to be. I'll hear halfway hoose, but I be where extremes meet, 
It's the only way I can to dodge the cursed conceit of being wrecked that damns the vast majority of men. I'll bury nae heed like an ostrich's, nor yet believe my in and nothing else. My senses may advise me, but I'll be myself, nae matter what they tells. I hae nae doubt some foreign philosopher has wrote a system out to justify all this, but I'm a Scot who blindly follows all Scottish instincts, and I want to try. Wow. So good. Oh, that's fantastic. <clears throat> okay, so Anna, first, pick a passage, a phrase, a line, and tell us why you picked it and what's important about it. So let's see. I'm at line 141. Oh, yes, that's a good one. Yeah. And I'm going to... You're going to try to read it? Go ahead. No, I'm going to translate it. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> But I'm where extremes meet. It's the only way I know to dodge the cursed conceit of being right that damns the vast majority. Oh, of you're going to do that whole stanza. Wow. All right, Anna. Why did you pick this? What is this about extremes meeting? Well, as we as we talked about, something that McDermott is interested in is the is the way in which opposites should be held as opposites and right. maintain their opposition to each other. This is a very important idea of this poem yeah. overall. So it seems like this is a good stanza to kind of come, like get to that idea. But. Mm -hmm. And uh, before we uh, talk about that more, what is the second, the, the second two lines saying here? Uh, to, to dodge, it's the only way I know how to dodge the cursed c conceit of being right. I just love that. I mean, it, it, it's a way of expressing a kind of radical openness, mm -hmm. a kind of uh, belief in if, if you hold on so tight to being right about something, you can never be convinced of anything, anything else, any other position, any other way of speaking or reading. Or so It's it, quite brilliant. I mean, McDermott personally was known as a, well, I, difficult is the wrong word, um, uh, strong-headed, you know, th believed in his ideas and 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 f pushed forward. But what he's saying here, and I believe it seems to be true about his life as well as his work, is that he's he does have the the curse of being right, but he also at the same time allows extremes to uh, coexist, which means he doesn't get Dogma he's dogmatic personally, but he's not dogmatic intellectually. Yeah. Does that make any sense? So, yeah, it's interesting. Okay, so back to um, uh, the extremes meeting. It seems to me that he's talking about his poem here in a way. Sure. Yeah. And. But I also love, I mean, poetically speaking, the way that he breaks the line at extremes meet. Well, that's he a, puts a dash in there. Yeah. yeah, that's a great way to, or sorry, breaks the line at I be war. Mm -hmm. Extremes meet. Breaks the war line there. And, where, right? Yeah. Where. I like that the line breaks there to put us from one line of the poem to the next. Uh, yeah, so Christy, say, I, you, actually, according to the plan we have here, it would be your turn to talk about a different passage, but I invite you to say something about that uh, this be where extremes meet, that this sort of being the poem. Yeah, I mean, it really is. It's, 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 very, it's been a been core, uh, core concept to the, to the whole piece. Um, and I, I love that. I love that. Uh, the cursed conceit of being left that damns the vast majority of men is, 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 uh, is, is a really... Really, a uh, really lovely, really lovely thing, um, and I, I think the one one thing that I take from it is that if you're if you're right, and, and I think with the the notes kind of bring this out, which are excellent. Yes. Um, the, the, if 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 you're right and you know you're right, then where do you go? You know, uh, if 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 you if if you're not quite right, then you've still got some search to do some exploration, some development, some work. You know, you've got a reason. Yeah, and here <laughs> I'll I'll just add that here the drunk man conceit, the idea of a drunk man being the speaker, makes it lovely and comic when 
a drunk man insists that he's right. I, God damn it, I'm right. <laughs> you must think it's the best thing you've ever heard because you get all the personality of rightness. Sure. All that fabulous temperament of someone who is sure, but you think this person is drunk on his ass. He's not right about anything. <laughs> and so you have that wonderful combination of sweetness almost. Sweetness it is. It's very tender. and latitude and um, brightness and a willingness to turn on a dime topically. And But if if the vast majority of men who feel they are right right are are cursed by rightness then we should all get drunk and relax a little bit but to con continue being right yeah yeah okay all right christy you want to pick a passage that interests you here yeah i really like the, the, the I'm, i've been really fascinated by the, the the one just before today so i walk in my crazy little brain and other folks packing itself seriously and in a sudden wow of fun, my soul blanks dozen as the owl I ken it to be. That's well read. What what is he saying there? So you see, it, it what it, it, it creates a creates a lovely picture in my head uh, of of these crazy little brains, um, and and the, the juxtaposition with that the 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 owl, I can almost kind of see the. McDermott and Soul as like a, an owl watching this this forest of uh, jumping brains, <laughs> and then kind of kind of feel feeling watching and, and watching and, and then when he sees the right one, then he'll swoop and uh, he'll uh, pick up in his claws and feed it to his young or whatever. Wow, <laughs> what an image. Um... That is really something. The cra to see my to see my crazy little brain and other folks, everybody else's crazy little brain. Yeah, that's marvelous. Okay, that's great. Okay, I um, I just want to take a phrase. Okay, uh, an ocean in a muchkin. That was my other favorite. Now that is the anti-syzygy that I love about this poem. Syzygy, S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y, which is what we talked about earlier in part one, and that is the syzygy is the idea of integrating opposites, and anti-syzygy, which this, this poem is an anti-syzygist poem, which is against, against the synthesis of opposites. Right. And I ran across a concept, Caledonian anti-syzygy, and Caledonian is a beautiful word for the Highlands, right? Anything that's associated with the Highlands? Or Scotland in general. Well, or Scotland in general. In Scotland. I mean, I mean there, was, there was a tribe called the Caledons somewhere. Right. Somewhere, okay. Didn't, it was, wasn't that the Roman name for Scotland? Was that the Roman name for Scotland? Yeah, okay, for the territory, yeah. yeah. All right. So Caledonian anti-syzygy is, is what this poem is all about and really what his concept of modernism is all about. And an ocean in a muchkin is perfect, yeah. right, for that. Because the, the ocean is very important. In 1926, you have, uh, you have modern ideas such as Freud's idea of the oceanic, uh, the oceanic feeling, which is the kind of modern version of, the, of romanticism. Uh, having a, you know, a, sorry, a, po a poet that is not... Anna, a poet that is not Christie, a poet that is not Hugh McDermott, would say, and I'm going to do my poet voice, okay? Oh, right. yeah, let's hear it. Right. My heart, <laughs> it's beheld by the ocean that it cannot hold. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, the idea is that the ocean You're is... In your a, best high school lit mag oh, voice. <laughs> God. That the ocean is... Um, <laughs> The place where we, the place where we all should aspire to be in terms of our the wideness of our concepts, and our origins, but he really mocks that an ocean in a Michkin. A Michkin is a pint. Mm. Now it's not just a pint, but when you when you're when you're a drunk man, I imagine pint has a very special connotation. No. <laughs> A pint glass. It's the unit of measure of, of drunkenness beer. of beer. <laughs> 
an <laughs> ocean in a Michigan. So what you it just it just really love that it is great. Uh, idea. First of all, it's just beautiful the f- sound. An ocean in a Michigan, a Muchkin. I said Michigan. I apologize. A Muchkin. It's even better. Uh, the, a, uh, a big, big, amorphous, boundaryless, categoryless concept that every poet aspires to in a pint. And you can kind of look at it yep. if you're in your pints. Uh, you know what? I think we're going to go to the last section now. Yeah. I'm going to call a halt to that one, but that's a good one. This is just lovely. I, I'm so moved by this this passage that we're going to listen to and talk about. It is amazing. So let me cue it up here on my little device. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to hear, we're going to hear McDermott read the, the second part of the italicized stanza, and then our passage starts, Thou art the facts. All right, so here he goes. So we've moved all the way to the end of the poem now. So we are, yes, we're on page 159, around line 1455 or so, you know, that far into it. Here we go. And it's loading very slowly. Here we go. Nay man can ken his heart until the tide of life uncovers it, and horror struck he sees a pit returning life can never fill. Thou art the facts in ilka earth that brings into eternity, crisscrossed with countless other facts nay man can follow, and of which he is himself a helpless pert, held in their tangle as he were a stick nest in Yggdrasil. The less man sees the mere he is content to it. But the Mary sees that the Mary kens who little owe all that there is he'll ever see. And who it makes confusion, eh, the war confounded, till at last his brain inside his head is like Ariadne with an empty pern, or like a bedlam reel through which a whale has arrived the line of war. What better's up for who he'd nest than Skaslock scattered o'er the ground? Wow, okay. Let's do the same thing. Let's uh, go around and pick out a phrase or a passage that will help everyone understand what's going on here. So, Anna, do you have one? Uh, why don't you let Christy go first okay, for this Christy? one? Okay, <laughs> Christy. I'm going to st- st- punt. <laughs> Christy, start, start by saying why you think I picked well when I picked this passage of this long poem. Well, because it, 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 it does... Uh, it, it does it has a lot has a lot of the, especially the, the, the third the third stanza that we heard from him there uh, has a lot of uh, this Caledonian anticipity and <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, especially this bit of the last the less man sees the Mary is content with it. The Mary see the Mary kings the little oh, ah, that there is a little see. Can you uh, can you choose that as the passage to discuss first then? The less I, man, the less man sees, the mayor he is content. Yeah, I'd be delighted to. Yeah, so 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 the less so the, the less man sees, the mayor is content with it. So if 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 you have if 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 you have an, if, if if you have a a, 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 a quiet and, and intellectually uninvolved life, then you're happy. Um, and if you've never been exposed to um, uh, ideas that are that are happening in other parts of the world and that, that are, are bringing the human race forward, then you're okay with it. Just carry on in your uh, your station in life. Um, but the man sees, and and that's you know this is this is a, 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 I guess it's almost a it's a philosophical. Almost a very logical thing. Well, the 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 mayor sees the mayor. He kens who little or oh, there is he'll ever see. So the more you know, the more you realise how little you know and how little you will ever be able to know uh, because of the vastness of, uh, of 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 available knowledge and um, and, and because of our uh, minuscule. 
pick a passage from this section. Um, another moment that I just really like, um, his invocation of the, um, the legend of the Minotaur, the Ariadne with an empty pairn, which is this, some kind of thread. Yeah. So he's basically, Ariadne was the person who led Theseus out of the labyrinth by giving him thread. Yeah. So that, what a, like a beautiful image, like to, to sort of call upon classical Greek mythology in that moment, but to not give Ariadne the thing that she actually used to get Theseus out of the labyrinth. Mm. Like, what an amazing twist. Uh, or Let's stay with that for a second. Yeah. So spell that out a little further. Um, so the full passage, um, his brain inside his head is like Ariadne with an empty pairn. And pairn is what? A, a bobbin, so something you, a little cone on which you hold thread. Okay. So, what is Ariadne in a sane, sober poem, as opposed to this one? Right. <laughs> what would Ariadne do in the service of the poem? She would, she would have your thread that would lead you out of this crazy, labyrinthine, confusing epic. But instead... <laughs> instead, it's an empty pairn. It's there is no pair. thread there's on no the thread. bobbin. There's no... The bobbin yeah. is empty. There's, there's that no... is it. it that is, is it. There's there no... is nothing more that needs to be said about yeah. this poem. Ariadne co appears in the poem, and she leads us nowhere because there's no thread left. And I think following the thread so has got to be as much a Scottish idiom as it is an American idiom. Following yeah. the thread, yeah. right? Do you follow the thread? You know, do you that's, follow that's what I'm saying? From. The answer is, I don't follow because there's no thread. There's no thread to begin with. <laughs> and there's no key. There's no, like, reading, I mean, not to, not to, you know, just be mean to T.S. Eliot, but, I mean, reading The Wasteland requires, and like, encyclopedic knowledge of language and mythology. Well, and he does play with that a little bit here. He does, but. With his Scandinavian tree myth, but. He does, but but to read Elliot, I mean, my my copy of the Wasteland from when I was an undergrad is filled with, oh, this is a reference to this, and this means this in Latin, and this means this in Greek, and like here's the Sanskrit, and and it, it's not a knock. I mean, there's so you're saying that is subject to accusations of pretension, being pretentious, but this is not pretentious, right? Right. I think that's what we're saying. Yeah. And that is the ultimate praise of a poem that is this ambitious, that it's yeah. ambitious without being pretentious. I think that goes back to the character of the drunk man, whom Christie says cannot be distinguished from the poet, um, that he's really right about everything, but he's also drunk on his ass and isn't going to stay on any topic long enough to annoy you. Right. So final thought. Has this been fun? Did you so learn a lot? Fun. Oh, I did. Yeah, this is so That's much fun. That's because of Christy. I know. Thank you, Christy. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I'll just say that I love this poem's argument for both confusion and drunkenness. Mm. So yeah. it makes a good case for both of those states of being. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really good. I mean, I, I I'm not a I'm not a big drinker, and I'm, I'm not necessarily a fan of being this drunk. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> or Baron is drunk. Or a dozen cocktails would be right. much. <laughs> but I, I, I think that what's interesting is the... Oh, I'm getting a final thought. I didn't expect oh. to. I just think that as a frame device for freeing yourself, a drunken look at a thistle is just a great it is. frame. It's a great set up yeah really you know he wasn't drunk when he wrote this poem he couldn't have been it's so amazing but maybe maybe a little well but... as bukowski would say you write drunk and edit sober yeah i don't think this is <laughs> charles bukowski but okay no. uh so christy your final thought i don't think you would have written entirely dry all the time yes <laughs> right but you do you're sober when you write yeah well i'm always gonna hit it <laughs> 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 so I, I guess I guess my final thought um, is is um, is is how uh, I, I, I'm pleased I am that, that this is that, that this is getting a uh, getting uh, a, a, a wider audience through uh, through Kelly Writer's House and uh, and, 
and it's really really interesting to have uh, other other the other other cultures uh, people people from uh, people who aren't from Scotland uh, uh, engaging with the with the text because it is very fundamental you know, the, uh, to to our, our understanding in Scotland of uh, uh, what poetry is and 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 uh, and and. and, and uh, so it's been really, really refreshing to have uh, uh, your perspective on it okay. uh, and to, to, to kind of meet across the waves <laughs> by the medical technology. Uh, yeah, I just, can I just ask a question? Yeah, you're asking me or Christy? Christy. Mm-hmm. Why, Sorry. yeah, why do you think, because I really had not heard much about McDermott or this poem at all until Al emailed me and said, hey, do you want to do this well, video? Well, you went to St. Andrews. I know, it's but... It's a very elite place. I did, and all we studied were English writers. <laughs> I'm... Burns... The, he's going to fall out of the I box. Know. He's going to fall out of the TV. You Burns hear was that, the Christy? only one. They, she went to St. Andrews for a year, and she learned British poetry. It's terrible, I know. And that's yeah, why... Shorts. No, I would love to be shocked by that. We only did Burns. I mean, we did Tam O'Shanter, and that's it. Um, wow. I, I learned about a lot about Scottish architects, if that helps. <laughs> that's good. But, okay, so my question is, why is this poem not as well known as a Ulysses or a Wasteland or another modernist epic? Like, why do you think I'm that gonna is? I'm going to let Christy answer that question, but all I want to say is we don't have a... Mod Poe video about Ulysses, and, well, it's prose, and we don't have really anything about Eliot, and we now are going to have one about McDermott, so maybe we can have our little eeny yeah. weeny effect on yeah. people's interest in this book, in this poem. I mean, we, don't, Zach, we barely this even one have... here, the thing that you can focus <laughs> on, this one right here, it is a marvelous work. Yeah. It, but so now Christy will tell us why maybe it's not as well known as it should be. It's hard to read for Americans, for one thing. Yeah, well, I think, I think that's, that's, you can, yeah, you can't, you can't underestimate that, that it, it does, does love it, does love your readership. Um, it, it, I think, it, I mean, it's hard for me, but you know, I, 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 it's, I, I write, you know, I, I write the stuff. Mm. Yeah. I read a lot of it. Yeah. Um, so I think that that may have something to do with the, the fact that the street isn't as uh, uh, as uh, as wide as, as was other two texts. He, he refers to the wasteland and he, 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 he gives it a bit of a dig. He says <laughs> if it book early and moved further north, yeah. you might find a poem like this. <laughs> Did he really say that? That's amazing. Yeah, it does, yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. He That's was good. very acerbic. He he really, he could really cut you down. Yeah. Well, thank you, Anna, so much. Thank you, Al. And Christy Williamson, thank you so much. What a pleasure. Thank you. Sir. Okay. We'll see you. Well, you will. Okay. Take care. Okay.